This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. The other day, I took a drive down the road, just a few miles to the farm shop to go pick up some stuff that I needed. And I made the rookie mistake of leaving my camera at home. And I think the reason I did that is because when I left the house, the light was so flat and dull and it was overcast, it just looked really uninteresting. And I very rarely take photos in that kind of flat, dull light. However, as I pulled into the car park, the cloud had dropped and started to thin into mist, and there was a break in the clouds. The sun came streaming through this kind of misty background, backlighting these three beautiful trees just by the entrance of the farm shop. And in a moment, I cursed myself for leaving my camera at home, and just as quickly realized that I had a camera with me, my phone. So I took it out of my pocket and took a shot. Almost all of us have a phone in our pockets, and most of them these days are capable of taking some very serviceable images. In fact, when I posted this particular image to Instagram, it got higher engagement than most of the other images I posted in the same period. Why? Because people love a good image and really don't care what it was taken on. Does the camera on your phone have limitations? Yes, of course it does, and we'll get into some of those in a minute. But the point I wanna make here is that this is a good enough tool to take compelling images in your day to day if you're in a pinch, and it's a more than good enough tool to be able to constantly be teaching yourself how to see better images in your day to day and developing your photographer's eye. In fact, that's how I began in street photography. For at least the first year, I only used my phone, and those images still sit on my Instagram. I'm even proud of some of those images. And my phone was a more than capable learning tool to teach myself how to make good photographs. I often get messages from beginner photographers who say to me, I really wanna get into photography, but I don't yet have the money to buy myself a decent camera. And then they use that as an excuse not to even begin. But if you have a camera on your phone, you already have more than enough to get going and start to teach yourself how to take good photographs. I really believe that the only effective way to becoming a better photographer is to take a lot of photographs. It's why Henri Cartier-Bresson famously said that your first 10,000 photographs are your worst, because he's acknowledging that to some extent, it's a numbers game, and this can really help you rack up your numbers. I've heard songwriters say something similar, that they have to write a lot of songs to get the bad ones out of their system to arrive at the good ones. So if we think about this phone in our pocket that has a camera and using it in a more disposable way and taking a lot of images with it, we're gonna help ourselves get our bad photographs out of our systems so we can arrive at the good ones quicker. In fact, I would even suggest that your phone is a great tool for teaching yourself how to make good images because there's very little to hide behind on a phone. Most phones, their main lens is often a wider angle with lots in focus. You're not gonna have a long focal length and a shallow depth of field to hide behind. You're gonna have to include a lot of elements in your shots and learn how and where to place those elements in your frame. And that's gonna get you good at composition fast. And it's not just a learning tool. Most phones these days have very competent cameras in them. And I would hazard a guess that while you're going around using this to take a lot of images, you're also gonna have a bunch of images in there that are good, that you're really proud of. I know some really talented photographers that have produced whole bodies of work just on their phone and even sold books and put on exhibitions with the images made with the phone in their pocket. Dmitry Markov produces some incredibly compelling documentary work in Russia using only his iPhone. He works hard to gain access so he can share intimate stories with us of life in his home country. His phone is the right photographic tool for him because it's unobtrusive and far from being a limitation, it seems to keep him from bruising the scene and helps him to get those more intimate shots. Julian Carverley is a landscape photographer who produced a whole book called Hashtag iPhone Only with images he made entirely on his phone from shooting to editing. His phone isn't just a tool to help him practice on, but he's decided it's good enough to produce final bodies of work with as a professional and then to sell that work. For me, his images have a really compelling look to them and don't suffer at all for being made on a phone. So let me give you some practical rules of thumb that I use when taking images on my phone. And if you're interested, this is just the Samsung Note 20, but most phones on the market these days will have phones with similar capabilities and functions. Whether you're on iPhone or Android, it might be worth looking through their app stores to see what camera apps they have available that are better than the ones that come with the phone that give you a little bit more control. But to be honest, I just go with the one that's built into the phone because it's good enough for the way that I want to take images. In the camera app on this phone, I select 
select the pro mode, which gives me more control over things like my exposure and my white balance, which I can dial in myself. And then I make sure to go into the menu for the camera and make sure that I'm shooting in RAW, which is gonna give me as much information in the image as possible for when I get to that processing stage. If your phone, and most of them do these days, have multiple lenses and sensor configurations on the back, it's a good idea to go and look up the specs and work out which one gives you maximum resolution. And on this one, it's the main wide lens, which gives you roughly a 28 mil equivalent. And that will give me, on that sensor behind that wide lens, that will give me 64 megapixels. So that's the lens that I choose to use when I'm taking images. It's worth a warning at this point to be aware of the zoom function on the camera on your phone. Most phones will let you pinch to zoom while you're composing your image, but you need to know what it's doing. Some phones get very clever using the different lenses so that it's sort of an optical zoom that isn't throwing away that much resolution. But usually what your phone is doing is as you pinch, it's just cropping it down on the sensor and you are throwing away information and resolution to your image. So find out how your phone zooms and what you're losing when you do that because it might be worth taking some steps forward to compose your image closer instead of standing back zooming and losing that resolution. If you wanna keep things super simple and just use the camera app as it comes with the phone, you don't wanna mess with the pro mode or anything else, you can still take some control. And the way that it works with most phones is that as you compose the shot, you tap for wherever you wanna focus your image and the little bar will appear either underneath or on the side and then you can slide either left or right depending on the phone or up and down and that will change your exposure so you can still be dialing in the exposure that you want in your shot manually. Usually when you're changing your exposure this way, most phones fix the aperture in the lens the same so that's not changing and I know that on this main lens it's an f2 lens. What it's doing is it's either changing the shutter speed or the ISO or both in order to bring your exposure up and down. And it's good to be aware of that. Just keep an eye on it, especially in low light. If you're boosting your exposure because you want things a bit brighter, if it's gonna drag out your shutter speed, it might start to blur the motion in your image. So just watch that and make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. Or it might be pushing your ISO up, which is gonna introduce a lot of noise. So it's a good idea as you experiment to work out what those trade-offs are, so you know when you're dragging your exposure what it's gonna to do to the image that you're taking. But let's get honest and talk about some of the limitations of using the cameras on our phones. And the first is obvious that they have very, very small sensors built in. I mean, a lot of these phones have multiple cameras in them. So obviously those sensors have to be tiny to fit into something this small. And smaller sensors mean smaller pixels. And there's a lot of marketing that goes on from phone companies saying, well, now we're giving you 50 megapixels and 60 megapixels and 100 megapixels on something that fits in your pocket. But the sensor size isn't getting any bigger. So it means that those pixels are getting smaller and smaller. It's just physics. And with smaller pixels comes its own set of problems. Capturing a good digital image isn't just about the number of pixels capturing that light. It's also about the quality of those pixels. And when you make those pixels smaller, you start to introduce issues like artifacting and ghosting and poor low light performance that can only be fixed with computational photography that has to go on in the software of the phone. And again, that can start to create problems. Printing the images that we make on our phones is something we can and definitely should be doing. In fact, that image that I mentioned at the beginning of this video at the farm shop, I've actually sent off for a couple of large prints of that image so we can look at them together and see how they do, see how they hold up. But the point is that when you make images on a phone and print them big and look at them close, that's when you'll start to see those ghosting issues or those artifacts starting to show up. So there definitely is a ceiling. The second limitation you'll find when taking images on your phone is you'll have very limited options for depth of field. You're not gonna be able to shallow things out and create beautiful optical bokeh in the background, unless you get very, very close to your subject, then you might be able to force it. But most of these phones have wider angle lenses onto tiny sensors, which is just not a formula that works for that super shallow depth of field look. Lots of phones today try and do a good job of creating digital blur in the background and some of them are getting very, very clever with it, but I just find that it's not realistic and on closer inspection, it often doesn't hold up. Which brings us to the third limitation when shooting on your phone and that's the software inside that's trying to help you take a better image. Personally, I turn off every aid that it gives me inside the phone. No sharpening, no scene detection, no fake background blur, because I want to generate the cleanest image possible I can out of the phone. 
And let me say a quick word about HDR, which most of you will just know stands for high dynamic range, which is where the phone takes multiple exposures and combines them together, which serves a beginner photographer or just your average user very, very well because they want the phone to see like their human eye sees. They want to stand in front of a sunset and have the sky beautifully exposed, but also the darker foreground exposed so that everything looks nice and even. However, the way that I like to shoot is to embrace that contrasty look and that limited dynamic range that most cameras have. So I turn off the HDR on the phone because I know that if I have it activated and it's trying to capture all those tones and combine them together, if I want to go back to that contrasty look in post, I'm really going to have to pull curves and levels and contrast to get back there. And the more you push and pull that image apart, the more it starts to break up. For me, by using the phone in this way, I'm turning it into more of a traditional camera. I'm turning off the aids, I'm taking control of my exposure using pro mode, I'm turning off the HDR, I'm looking for the good light and exposing it correctly and using the limited dynamic range of the camera as a feature not a bug. And in that way, I'm almost using this like I'd use my normal daily cameras, the Ricoh GRs. So to sum up, my advice, if you want to take more control of the images that you're making on your phone, will be to go into your settings, make sure you have RAW selected, so you're capturing images with as much information in them as possible. Make sure you work out which lens and sensor combo has the highest resolution in it and stick to that focal length. Use that limited focal length like a prime and embrace the challenge that that brings. You're going to have to use your legs to zoom and compose and move around, but you're going to have images with much more information in them. And then select the mode in your app, which gives you the most control, probably some sort of pro mode, and turn off all the computational assistances, all that background, fake bokeh and HDR, and then start to use your phone like you would the camera that you use every day by taking back more control, using the limited dynamic range creatively, and I think you'll make better, cleaner, more compelling images. In short, we live in an amazing time where most of us are walking around with very capable cameras with us in our pockets at all times. And that means we don't have any excuse to not be developing our photographer's eye, no matter where we are or what we're doing. If we have five or 10 minutes to kill, we can pull our phone out of our pocket and teach ourselves to compose better, to expose better, to put together a compelling frame. This is an amazing, almost omnipresent photography teaching tool that you have with you no matter where you go. And if you have your settings saved the way that you like them, it means you can pull this out of your pocket and at a second's notice be ready to take images that will either teach you something or that you'll be proud of and want to share with the rest of the world. Now let's go take a look at those prints that I ordered and see how they hold up. So as I said, I took that image that I mentioned at the beginning of the video and I sent off for two prints from the print space who I mentioned in my previous video. I ordered two different sizes just to see how they hold up. And the one size is uh, A2 and the other is A3. I just wanted to see what the resolution uh, of those images does at those different print sizes. And the paper that I chose was Fuji uh, Crystal Archive Matte, which is my go-to paper of choice for color prints. And Right out the gate, actually, that's pretty impressive. So that is the A3, which at that viewing distance probably looks great, but even up close really doesn't look that badly. Any print falls apart if you look at it really, really closely, if the resolution isn't there. Um, but actually, that's not bad for, for a mobile phone shot. And this is the A2 print, which uh, also looks pretty good, actually. I'm quite surprised. I, I haven't actually printed any images out of my mobile phone at this size. And yeah, if I'm gonna be honest, I can look close and I can see some little issues there. But the thing you have to remember about prints as well is you're always going to be at a particular viewing distance from the print. So you don't normally have people walking up to prints and sticking their nose against it to really kind of look at the details and work out what the issues are. They're designed to be seen from a certain distance. It's why Apple can get away with shot on iPhone billboards that are the meters long and the images look great. That's because they look great at a distance. If you get close to those billboards, it falls apart very, very fast and you can even see the dots that are used in the printing process. The viewing distance is very important. And I have to say that yes, if I really pixel peep this, I can see that, yeah, there are a couple of issues. There's some things sort of in the, in the branches and the tree that if I look really, really closely, I can see where those issues lie. But if this image is taken in, either of them at either size are taken in at the proper viewing distance, I have to say that I'm pretty impressed with that. I think it came out 
pretty well. And I'd be happy to hang that on my wall. I think what it shows me straight away is what a powerful little tool this is that sits in my pocket. If I can actually produce prints that look this good from something that's always with me, it might not be the very best camera in the world, but if I use it in a particular way and I control that exposure and get rid of that computational mess that often goes over the top of it, you can produce some pretty decent quality prints that I would happily put on my wall and at a push even sell. So I hope this goes to show you, especially if you're a beginner and you've been using that excuse of I can't afford a fancy camera yet so I can't get started, that is only an excuse because what you have in your pocket is definitely good enough to go around and begin practicing your photography and producing decent images that are gonna help you learn how to compose and expose. And maybe, like Dmitry Markov or Julian Calverly, you'll actually decide that what's coming out of this thing is actually good enough to produce bodies of work and even sell that work on to your followers. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode. If you need a new website or a domain, they're a fantastic option. I've used them myself for my website of choice for over a decade now. One of the things I love about Squarespace is how clean and minimal everything looks. They have a whole host of templates put together by professional designers, and it's very easy when you're putting your website together. You just go into the back end, you drag in blocks for your images and your text, and then when it's displayed on that front end through your template of choice, the design sits in the background. It doesn't shout or become overbearing, and it really pushes your work front and center. It gives you a good space to house your work so that your work does the talking. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and go to squarespace.com forward slash Sean Tucker to get 10% off your first purchase.